I don't even know if I need it. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Michael. I work at Corpus in Melbourne. Hey, Todd. Um, on the bio for this thing, it said, not a historian, not an academic. And so if anything's wrong, don't fucking at me. I don't care. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm just a tattooer with access to Google, essentially. Um, but yeah, I, I thought when Reese asked him if I wanted to do a seminar on tattoo imagery, I was like, oh, I'll do one on Crawling Panther because that's sick. And then Ed Hardy's already done it. So I can't just rip his. So we're doing dragons. I figured dragons sort of transcend most genres, most styles of tattooing. Um, yeah, so let's get into it, I reckon. Um, I'm going to be reading this as well. So I'm sorry about that. I'm also going to be saying the word dragon fucking heaps. So I'm sorry about that. So in this presentation, we're going to delve into who first came up with the very concept of dragons and then when they started being integrated into tattoos um, and how we arrived at the dragon tattoos we see today. Um, we're also going to be specifically looking at like various Asian styles of dragons, not like Nordic Celtic dragons, because um, they're shit. They're shit dragons. <laughs> um, all right. So let's see if this works. Hey. All right, so 6,000 years ago in a region known as Mesopotamia, there was a civilization known as the Sumerians. And Mesopotamia is a land that now mostly consists of Iraq and Iran, and the Sumerians are being credited as the first civilization to write any form of scripture. And in those scriptures, among many other things, they mention the first recorded iteration of dragons. Nice. Following very closely behind the Sumerians were the Mongolians, and the first depictions of dragons like this one, carved out of jade, belonging to the Hongshang culture. Uh, despite this C-shaped figure being one of the first incarnations, it's still probably the most well-known, as it's still used today in everything from company logos to posters, uh, like welcoming visitors at the Beijing airport. Um, dragons started becoming used across various forms of religious and secular art from China, uh, from paintings to ceramics, textiles, engraving, landscaping, and used as decorative borders on various sort of handmade objects. Early Chinese dragons better seen here, Kun, <laughs> uh, better seen here from representations from 3,100 years ago in the Shang Dynasty and 2,000 years ago in the Han Dynasty were heavily inspired by saltwater crocodiles, as were sort of the Vietnamese dragons of the time. Whoa, too far. Cool. Um, and as mythology developed, so did the look of these dragons. For example, here are some bronze casts in the Temple of the Dragon King, built in 1631. And the evolution of their appearance basically grew along with their origin stories and the magical powers that were just being made up. Uh, the best part is no one has actually seen a dragon, so I guess someone just decided what they looked like at some point, and we've just run with that ever since. Um, Cool. So the appearance of these dragons evolved from being inspired by saltwater crocodiles to being an amalgamation of various animals. They came to possess the antlers of a deer, the head of a camel. No, that's not fucking going. Head of a camel. I don't even know where I'm meant to point this thing, hey? Yeah, there we go. Uh, the eyes of a rabbit. Ears of an ox, neck of a snake. How's the suspense with this thing, hey? The uh, chest of a cockle. <laughs> the scales of a carp. Yep, cool. Paws of a tiger and talons of an eagle. My God, that was way harder than it needed to be. So when did the dragon tattoos start happening? In ancient China, there were three main tribes that practiced ritualistic tattooing. One of those tribes opted for more illustrative designs of ferocious beasts, while the other two tribes tended to tattoo patterns and symbols instead. In the Han Dynasty, 2,000 years ago, the people of the Dai tribe would tattoo images of dragons and tigers with sewing needles and ink to accentuate the men's muscles and signify strength and virility. It was also common for these men to start getting tattooed from the ages of five or six. However, it's near impossible to find images of any of those sort of original tattoos. 
So that leads us to when did dragons start showing up in Japan? Seeing as Chinese ideas were passed along to Japan, such as rice cultivation, writing, Buddhism, centralized government models, temple architecture, literature, and art, it's no surprise that Japan ripped the dragon as well. The first time dragons appeared in Japanese mythology was approximately 680 AD, which was over 4,600 years after they started surfacing in Chinese mythology. Come on, you can. There we go. In Japan, they can also be linked to, oh no, I've got ahead of myself. It was actually in Chinese folklore where the dragon initially started off as a carp uh, who wanted to swim upstream and explore a mountain. In order to get to the mountain, it had to jump over a dragon gate where it would then transform into one of nine different kinds of dragon. <laughs> Just heavy breathing into the microphone. How good's that? That way. I mean, six, 17 slides ago, but thank you. <laughs> uh, in Japan, they can also be linked to various gods and deities who shape-shifted into dragons, uh, which is why they seem to be adorning various Buddhist and Shinto temples across the country. It's believed that they reign over the oceans to fight and defend the gods. This piece showing twin dragons was painted on the ceiling of the oldest temple in Kyoto in 1202 AD. And this particular temple is believed to be the birthplace of tea ceremonies and the concept of Zen in Japan. It was painted by Koizumi Junsaku, and it took him about two years to complete. Hey. Japan has had tattooing ingrained in its culture for centuries, with tribes like the Ainu people of Hokkaido, descendants of the indigenous Jomon people, believed to go back as far as 12,000 years. The Ainu are believed to have continued the ancient practices of marking the body with tribal tattoos, including big black grins across the faces of their women. Uh, and tattoos were mostly marks to represent either spiritual spirituality or status, um, and the grins served to prevent evil spirits entering the mouth. However, the Irizumi bodysuits that we mainly associate nowadays with Japanese tattooing didn't really take off until the Edo period, which was about 420 years ago. These tattoos were done with a traditional hand poke method known as tabori, and tabori drew huge inspiration from the Yukioe woodblock prints, which would often depict scenes from stories of Japanese folklore. The word tabori means to hand carve. The skin would be tattooed in a way not unlike the preparation of a wooden block for printmaking. <laughs> Good song. Uh, as a result, these woodblock prints led to dragons crossing over from folklore into tattoo culture. And the fundamental key difference, the fundamental key difference between Japanese dragons and the Chinese dragons is that Japanese dragons have three toes and Chinese dragons have five. Uh, Japanese people also like to take credit for the creation and they state that it must have just grown two extra toes when it flew over into China. I mean, it's pretty, uh, pretty dicey, if you ask me. So this leads us to the next, uh, how the three-toed dragons made the, their way all over to Europe. Uh, in 1542, the first Europeans to land in Japan were three Portuguese navigators who ended up there by accident when they got blown off course from Macau. While they were there, they managed to establish a trade agreement and 100 years later, the shogun banished trade to Europe and expelled all Westerners from Japan except for a few Dutch traders. Uh, then in 1812, the head of the Dutch trading station in Nagasaki brought some Japanese woodblock prints back to Europe for the first time. And in 1854, Two Japanese ports opened up trade again to the West, and in 1861, some French publications started printing reproductions of manga designs and various artists such as, uh, from various artists such as Hokusai. And over the next 20 years, there became exhibitions of Japanese woodblocks and manga throughout Europe and the UK, uh, and it ended up inspiring French poster design, as well as impressionists such as Monet, Manet, and Van Gogh, who all came across their prints in Holland and France. Japanese art was seen as incredibly exotic and in vogue, and the social elites began trying to collect pieces for their own personal collections. 
This led to those people of privilege uh, to venture to Japan themselves to see the land they'd come to appreciate through the art. The Duke of York, uh, who went on to become King George V, King of England, received a dragon tattoo on his forearm from a Japanese tattooist named Hori Cho. That's Hori Cho. Uh, and he loved it so much he paid for Hori Cho to come back to Europe and tattoo various royals from Denmark to Greece. Rich Westerners going to Japan would receive tattoos. Uh, it became so common that Japanese tattooers even started advertising in Europe through Japanese travel guides. This was also partly because the Japanese government cracked down on tattooing and made it illegal to tattoo Japanese citizens. However, this just pushed tattooing underground and it opened a loophole where it was still okay to tattoo foreigners. In the 1880s, a man named Sutherland MacDonald began tattooing with hand tools, not too dissimilar to the process of Tabori, while serving in the British Army. And in 1889, he opened the UK's first ever tattoo parlour inside the Hammam Turkish Baths in London, and word spread of his tattooing prowess, and he considered to be the first ever professional tattooist in England, and remained the only one for about four years. And in 1894, he received the first British patent for the electric tattoo machine, which was a variation of Samuel O'Reilly's original tattoo machine, which was patented in America three years prior. And there's a dragon. Once news spread to the elites, um, they could get tattooed in London by Sutherland MacDonald. He was able to do it less painful tattoos with a machine in half the time, as well as being able to produce more detail thanks to the new tattooing technology. Everyone from soldiers to nobles would go to the Turkish baths to get their new tattoo. That's another one of his dragon designs. Um, so, so much, so much detail and like, yeah. Uh, he also had like a, a topical ointment that he put on to sort of numb it and I think it had cocaine in it, but don't. Don't fact check that. Uh, as you're about to see, the Army and Navy allowed many people to travel uh, the world and learn about other cultures, whether they were rivals or allies. And one such recruit was a man named George Burchett Davis, who enlisted in the Royal Navy and traveled to the West Indies, Africa, India, the Mediterranean, and all throughout Asia. He became fascinated by each culture's unique tattooing practices and received a tattoo kit from a fellow sailor, as well as accumulating some tattoos of his own. On his travels through Japan, George got tattooed by one of the masters, Hori Chio, and was well, who was well known for tattooing European aristocrats at the time. Upon returning to Britain after more than a decade living abroad, he was taken under the wing of Sutherland MacDonald and also expanded his clientele from the working class dockers to the rich and the powerful. Here's a dragon tattoo made on the chest uh, by Burchett on the King, or, uh, King Frederick IX of Denmark. And as you can see here, he's got another dragon tattoo going down his left bicep because um, everyone fucking loves dragons. This trend of Western soldiers and sailors embarking on tours of Asia continued throughout history with the art and tattooing customs piquing the interest of American tattooers as well, possibly the most famous of all being Norman Keith Collins, or as people know him by, Sailor Jerry. So Sailor Jerry, who sought inspiration from uh, Japanese tattooing, um, he was based in Honolulu, where he spent most of his time tattooing soldiers and sailors that would temporarily be stationed on the island during their service. Ironically, some of his most popular designs were inspired by the very country they were in a war against. And Sailor Jerry drew a lot of his um, inspiration for his larger scale work from the Irizumi bodysuits of Japan, including elements such as wind bars, clouds, finger waves. Uh, and this was made possible through corresponding with some Japanese tattoo masters, such as Horiyoshi II and Horihito Kazuo Oguri, uh, who would send photos back and forth. And Horihito is also the man that Ed Hardy would eventually study under during his stint in Japan. Okay. Um, if you look at both these Huck Spaulding dragons as seen on, oh no, I have fucking missed some shit here, haven't I? Oh, interesting. There we go, fuck it. Um, yeah, Huck Spaulding's dragons, uh, and this one's on Tom DeVita's back. You'll notice that the 
and has the head of a camel, antlers of a deer, ears of an ox, chest of a cockle, neck of a snake, scales of a carp, and it only possesses three toes on each foot. You can see that the uh, Americans slightly simplified their approach to the dragons from Japan, which were appropriated from the dragons of ancient China, and even to this day, dragons remain miraculously unchanged, which I think is pretty impressive considering how many cultures over such a long period of time, hello, um, it's, it's a made up creature and no one's thought to change it. It's treated like gospel, it's treated like fact, it's treated like it's a real thing. And at this point, I feel like it pretty much is. Um, thanks for coming to my TED talk. That's pretty much it. That's how we got from point A to point B. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. Thank <laughs> you.